Hello, this is John Goodwin, and welcome to this interview with Jim Meskimen, who was the director for Battlefield Earth Audiobook. And as we're entering summer reading, I asked him if we could talk, have a little uh, chat to talk about uh, his history with Battlefield Earth and how it ended up with him creating this uh, or being the director of this amazing audiobook. So, hello, Jim. Hello, John. Great to talk to you, and great to talk about Battlefield Earth. And yeah, I wasn't the creator of it by any means, but I got the honor of directing it, being at the helm of. Uh, you know, directing the uh, the voice actors, the many very talented voice actors, and it was a, a great, great, very wonderful experience. Yeah. So as we're coming into uh, summer reading happening right now, and we're celebrating the fourth anniversary of the uh, launch of this audiobook, tell me a little bit about your own history with Battlefield Earth, even before you were asked to uh, to uh, direct it. Yeah. Well, I uh, was aware of Battlefield Earth when it when it was published originally, and I saw it. Uh, around and as soon as it became a paperback and uh i was you know in my 20s then so i wasn't buying a lot of hardbound books <laughs> <laughs> i uh, i picked up that paperback and uh i just started reading it and it's one of those masterfully crafted books that you you, you don't even know the craft that goes into it until you start really uh reading it many times as i have but it picks you up and it just it just drags you along pulls you pulls you pulls you Every step of the way, every page is a page turner. Every chapter ends, you've got to get into the next one. It's like Breaking Bad. You know, it's like you've got to know what is in the next scene. You just, and, and you'll miss appointments. And in my case, I was living in New York. I would miss subway stations. <laughs> and, uh, and then I, I thoroughly enjoyed the book. It, it has an explosive payoff at the end that's really memorable. And then I would come back to Battlefield Earth and read it uh, like you revisit you know, your favorite books. And I would read it every, I don't know, every four or five years, I would go through the entire, what is it, 956 pages? I don't know. It's, it's a long, yeah, epic book. And I would pick it up and man, like once again, it would pull me along like a conveyor belt. And I had no choice but to go through. And every time I found more things in it, of course, and was, uh, you know, very appreciative of the craft of it and the characters and the genius of the plot and so I had a, a long history of admiration with this book before it, there was ever any discussion with me anyway of, of, um, of making it a, a, a truly modern uh, 21st century audio book. And uh, when I was asked, I was just, just very, very, the, the English say they're chuffed, which means they're very proud and you know, yes. full of themselves. And, uh, we don't say it in America, but we need a word like that. But I was very chuffed <laughs> to be asked. <laughs> and uh, and the experience itself was fantastic. And I was very, very familiar with the characters. I'd seen, it was like a movie you've seen in your mind. And that's the way the, the book, the writing is so good. Mm -hmm. That you see the characters, you see the action. It's very clear. And so you, I don't know, I mean, having read the book so many times, I, I'd sort of, it was a movie that I could, I, I had like images that I could refer to all the time. And so we, we basically brought, brought it all to life with that, uh, with the intent that the audience would develop their own pictures and we'd help them along with music and sound effects and great characters. And, um, and just sort of helped uh, the person, whoever the listener was mm -hmm. to see that movie in their mind. Now, one thing that's interesting, this is the book itself that uh, we're working on there. The, um, in the back of this latest edition, there's various, um, there's an interview that was done by Owen Hubbard mm -hmm. um, with the Rocky Mountain News. And in it, um, he says, one of the, and one of the answers uh, to the question of what is the message you hope to convey in Battlefield Earth, he says, regardless, it is a story of how mankind could survive and why. And he later goes on talking about that the spirit of man that will overall accomplish and defeat any adversity. How does that come across to you in this in this uh, book? Well, yeah, and, and it, it's very pertinent and very timely. <laughs> uh, it is a very it is a very well thought out and very well presented and very realistically presented uh, plot of how if Earth was invaded by a, a powerful technologically advanced force. You know, which, which of course many science fiction writers have tried to address. You know, and, sure. it, and it's, it, it, we see it in movies, and it's like it's it's a fascinating topic because, you know, we live in this universe, and who the hell knows right. it could happen. So he takes an intelligent, 
look at that, a very detailed look at that, and present something that that becomes like a real a real problem. You kind of go, well, wow. Well, if that if that happened, what would happen? So while we were working on the book, I remember John very well. That when we were, it took months. I think about uh, between six and nine months to record it. Mm-hmm. And all through that time, and I was working on it pretty much six days a week, all, all through that time, I felt very uneasy because <laughs> you're so in that, in that world. I felt like, you know, you're, you're, you're being, your life is threatened and you don't know how you're quite going to solve this. And uh, of course, that is the sprawling scale of Battlefield Earth is it's mankind is almost extinct. Right. And they have this slender chance to defeat the, the forces that are, enslaving them and basically eliminating them mm-hmm. and how do they how did they put together the plan and actually execute it and it's not well they called upon the spirits of the doom creatures and then they came and they devoured it it's not fantasy it's pure science fiction mm-hmm. so it's technology it's intelligence it's also politics it's also a little bit public relations it's all the different things that science fiction can encompass and so for me, it's just as pertinent as it ever was, even more so in some ways, because mankind is always under some threat or another, uh, usually very homegrown. And that's what we're going through right now yeah, to, yeah. Our, to our intense dismay. But, but it makes the point and demonstrates very realistically and very pertinently that uh, intelligence and decency and ethics and things like this, which are human uh, characteristics in a perfect world, uh, can defeat any superior force, no matter how huge and soulless and uh, heartless and and powerful. That's absolutely correct. So, was this the first Elwin Hubbard fiction book you had re- that you had read? Wow, that's a good question, John. You know, I think it was. I think it was. Yeah, of course, I, I went on was. to read every yeah. every bit of fiction he ever published because I, I went on and directed uh, all those other audio books. But um, yeah, you know, I think this was the very first one and it uh, it really blew me away. Yeah, because we were talking about just his pacing and several of our other uh, judges from Riders of the Future have talked about Battlefield Earth, how just they got tired reading it because physically tired because it was just so much energy <laughs> as it pulled you through you couldn't take a breath because the next you know, imagine reading it out loud <laughs> so you will use that as a little uh, segue into now let's talk about reading it out loud and yeah. and um how it was that you were able to, to maintain that energy level because that's 47 and a half hours of amazing amounts of energy that you guys are just pulling out of all the actors yeah well i i you know, I'd never really directed uh, too much, uh, but mm-hmm. I just felt like I could handle this because of all my years in voiceover and radio and and the animation. I felt like, you know, I, I kind of understand this job, and I love this book so much. I think this will this will this will be okay. So, but one thing I knew is that I wanted to um, I wanted to be able to be very in communication with every actor, and so I actually sat in the booth, which very few directors do. I sat mm-hmm. in the booth with the actors. And so that we had a very close contact and um, I knew enough about directing that I I, I wanted to not waste the impulses and the bright ideas of the artists that we had hired. Right. So even though I have a movie in my head of Battlefield Earth, I didn't try to get them to cleave to that or to match that. I listened to what they said. And as long as it didn't conflict with what I thought Hubbard was trying to express, I'd say that's a great choice. You know, that's, Mm -hmm. that's good, you know, if I had an idea, I would offer it to the actors, but not as a line reading or, hey, do it, do it this way. I, I never did that. I right. always like, I said, if you like this, here's an idea I had. And they, sometimes they'd like it, sometimes they didn't. But um, the, the big challenge fell on the shoulders of our main narrator, Josh Clark, very good theater actor that we were lucky to get. And uh, I don't think he's done a lot of audiobooks. Uh, this was his first. Mm-hmm. And uh, he and I sat in that boat together. I spent the most time with him. We'd spent months together because it's such a lengthy book and most of it is narration. Yeah. And like you said, John, the you have to keep up the pace, the action, the intensity. The narrator has to paint the whole picture of the scene. And then the other characters come in and they contribute. 
but the narrator has to has to really put the mood there and the mood in battlefield earth is always very strained until the very end <laughs> mm-hmm. it is extremely uh, uh, nerve-wracking and and sometimes tremendously action-packed as action-packed as any Marvel movie because it, it really truly encompasses an entire universe of action sometimes the biggest the biggest effects you can you can imagine so I keeping that going now luckily Josh was really game for it Josh Clark he did a fantastic job and he and I just kept at it we just kept chipping away it was it was as if we were trying to uh, drill a hole through a mountain Mm-hmm. get it some gold and we just and we we're in a big hurry big hurry to do it and right. and yeah. you can't you know tink 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 that doesn't work you gotta pound 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 that drill in and blow up the dynamite and and that's what we did the whole time and i it was a great time i really enjoyed my time i spent with it. i learned a lot you learn a lot from really good voice actors especially if you're a voice actor yourself and you're yeah. looking for tricks and stuff and i learned a lot from these guys any particular um segment that that you still remember that was like really as a stand up for you of like is this something that's either very novel very like a really cool thing or something that were totally unexpected gee i mean it's funny because the the experience was very fragmented because i would do the scene with josh as he would narrate it and then i would go back and do the scene with one actor then i go back and do the scene with another actor sometimes and so and then i would listen to it with the sound effects and so it was very uh it was not like we were doing it like a radio show. Right. Uh, certain scenes in that movie are just delicious to me because I think they they came out in a way that I think Mr. Hubbard would very be very proud of in, the, in terms of the characterizations and the, the types of voices that we were able to get and, and the support by all the music and the sound effects and so forth. I think the guy that played Turl, uh, Charlie Davis, was a, a very lucky piece of casting. He's uh, not a very well-known uh, voice actor, but he's sensational. And he's extremely well-suited for this particular part. Turl, the villain, is a very, uh, as you know, John, is a, a world-class villain. Uh, but he's not just a sadist. He's not just a, uh, a megalomaniac. He's not just a, a scheming um Know, terrorist he's also a genius I mean a real genius he's crafty he's uh, brighter than me he's brighter than any of us and uh, and yet he's the one that that, cr- that creates that great conflict because he's matched against the hero of the story so the hero of the story not only has to deal with you know being dealt a very bad hand and being born into, the, into this world where mankind has dwindled down to uh, maybe a few thousand people, but he's also up against a supervillain, a true supervillain, as written by Hubbard. And uh, Charlie Davis sounded fantastic, and he did such a great job, and he was so game to create that character. And so he and I sat in the booth again. I was with him, and uh, and we used a kind of uh, sound technology to pitch his voice down to make him sound like he was a thousand pounds, and uh, but not unnaturally. It's not like some cheap effect it really was really nice I think and and you really see him you see him in all his glory and uh, when I go back and listen to uh, Battlefield Earth which I still do I I like to listen to it Turl makes me smile all those Turl lines because Hubbard crafted him as a very a very full villain and you appreciate the nuances of his evil Mm -hmm. it's like you know we love villains in in movies and and the more um, it's not exaggerated exactly. It's just, I would say, rich and full a characterization is. There's something just delicious about it. Yeah, he's, um, he's definitely full of himself. He's full of himself. <laughs> and then uh, the guy who played Johnny, uh, uh, Scott, Scott Menville, terrific young actor. And I've worked with him before on animated shows. And he's just a really great guy and a really great voice performer. And uh, there's a scene when the drone... This is before anybody knew what a drone was, right? We read Battlefield Earth and went, drone, huh, interesting. And now they're everywhere. They're <laughs> ubiquitous. But uh, uh, the drone is this, is this gas drone that is a, a massive ship that gasses planet Earth and, and any planet that's being conquered by the, this race, the Cyclos. When Johnny goes up to stop that drone by whatever shifts and it's impenetrable and he's wounded and all these things happen, 
it's it's nerve wracking. It's such a it's such a nail biter. And and, and Scott Menville and I were <laughs> in doing it. We're biting our nails because it's just so intense. Yeah. And we're very interested in, in you know when actors get a great script, they really like to to bring it to life. That is what an actor loves to do. Yep. And they give their all to it, just like an Olympic athlete will give their all to running a marathon. So that's what we did, and, and it was super fun, and we were just spent at the end of it. So as we come up to um, summer now, that we're very much in the middle of, and I'm enjoying summer inside my office right now, and then I go mm -hmm. home and enjoy it inside my home, and then back. I see your roommate back. there. Your roommate there is enjoying it quite a bit. Exactly. Yeah. So. Um, what, why would you think this is a, such a great summer read slash listen? It's a great summer read because it's a, it's a perfect length. I mean, it's a good beefy story. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, these days, all, day, all these days are kind of running into one another. And uh, I don't know how long we're going to be in quarantine, but we're, we're certainly not stopping from um, um, consuming an awful lot of audio content. You know, we're listening to podcasts. We're doing all kinds of Zoom meetings and all kinds of things. So uh, we go, uh, now that the gyms have started to be open uh, and the great outdoors is open, it's a great time to stick in some earbuds and listen to Battlefield Earth, which is so transporting. And, and it'll, it has many benefits. First of all, it's a great story. It's fun. It'll make you laugh. It'll make you gasp. But also, it provides a kind of a... Uh, an example of a problem, a problem that is so much bigger than the problems that we really face today, that it will make your everyday problems seem minuscule. <laughs> and and there's a lot of there. That's a very therapeutic thing. I find. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what people love in escapism and great adventure stories. What we love in great novels and and great movies. We want a little. Let's step outside a little bit. Let's see somebody else has got it even worse than we have. And wow. If they can make it through that, for sure, I can make it through this little rough patch, whatever I'm going through. Absolutely. That's, this is the, um, the flash drive that we've created off of the audiobook that we did. And what's really nice about it is that it's a, it's a thumb drive, so you can plug it into your any device and listen to the audiobook wherever you are. And as um, an Audible, the Battle Earth audiobook has been one of the most um, I guess best selling of all the science fiction audiobooks they've had and they continue to re-promote it because it's been so successful. And I think the point you just brought up too of the um, a comparative, it gives you a comparative of someone who's got it just maybe a bit worse than you do. Just a bit. Um, <laughs> and overcomes it, you know, and it's interesting, he, you know, the value of libraries and reading is very much uh, validated by what Owen Hubbard talks about there. Um, that's how Johnny actually learns to be able to do it. He, the learning machine, you know, it's he, it's through education that he's able to overcome the uh, the obstacles and the barriers that he has to deal with. And it, it very much still is applying today to what we have to deal with. It's, it's going to be through education, not through dumbing down, but by actually, you know, getting educated in whatever it is that you're trying to deal with to be able to overcome it. So even though it's not necessarily written as here's, uh, you know, something that's full of parables and, and um, um, this is what you're supposed to get out of it. It's just, it's a great story that at the end, you, like you do, you realize like, okay, you know, you can overcome, you can survive no matter what and have a really good time, you know, getting that, that, uh, that storyline yeah. as it, as it complies. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the, the great gift of heroic fiction. You know, you see these heroes or these heroines in fiction and they don't have to tell you, hey, what you ought to do is be like him, be like me. You know, that's like that corny <laughs> cowboy TV show thing. It just just by demonstrating competence, just by demonstrating a willingness to confront a problem and and intelligently figure the way out through it instead of just going off and, you know, being oblique about the whole thing or <laughs> yeah. I don't know, going to the dispensary. Uh, they inspire you through example to tackle the problems in your own life. And it's, it's, it makes you feel better about yourself as well. So th there's a reason why we've, we've had heroes and heroines develop through fiction over all these millennia, really. Mm -hmm. uh, it, is, it is a great way for the human race to talk to itself, to inspire itself to greater things. That's absolutely correct. 
So I've never asked you this before, but do you have a personal favorite character in Battlefield Earth? Well, yeah. I, I mean, like I said, I, uh, I really like Turl a lot. I mean, it's hard to say he's my favorite character because he's such a villain. Uh, you certainly wouldn't want to emulate him. I'll tell you what scene I love the best, John. Okay. And, and it's very personal, I guess. But um, there's a scene with the old Cyclo. Johnny's trying to figure out the Cyclo math. And it's something mm -hmm. that he's just been racking his brain over. It has everything to do with the plot of the story. It's something, it's a formula that he needs very much. And it's just batty. And he just struggles with it and struggles with it for, I don't know, four or 500 pages. And he finally... Uh, an old, old member of this race finally says, oh, you want to know about cyclomath? Here, I'll explain it to you. And they have this, this nice little scene where he blows Johnny's mind. And we got an actor named Michael Forrest, who was a terrific film actor, an older actor, and just I didn't love him so much. And he embodied this character. And the way the scene is written is beautiful. And the genius of the cyclo math and the history of cyclo is as hubbard has written it is so rich and so genius that i just i i love that little scene it, 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 it's just gorgeous well in the back of the book again in the author notes which you can get me with the, the book <laughs> oh, the back, the, the it has the uh it has what he gives Ooh. explains what it is yeah. He explains the uh, their their math system and their numbers, how they yeah. do it, and yeah. how that ties into the whole math system. It's just, I mean, what 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 Hubbard was able to do with that to to create this. It's not just some ideas. He actually flushed the whole thing out, and made and created this whole mathematics him, himself, you know, for the book. And that's one thing. Also, I think it's just pretty amazing about about his fiction in general is just how accurate it is within itself. Yeah. You know, yeah. it, 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 if you go to try to be critical and stuff like that, and I've, you know, I, I handle all the various social media for all of L. Ron Hubbard on his, his social pages, as well as on Battlefield Earth and Mission Earth and Galaxy Press. And it's amazing just how many people talk about how accurate his science is, you know, mm -hmm. even yeah. though it is not quote unquote science, it's, it, it holds up, you know, to to um, actual looking through it and just seeing how you know, does this make sense? And I've talked to a few different scientists who have actually tried to how to take it take his lead there and see how does this work? Can mm. this be done? You know, mm -hmm. just uh, the medical aspect of it. You know, what he does to be able to um, operate on Johnny when he gets that mental in his brain. What they right. do on that, right? Um, and I even have a science teacher that used that with his kids as a science project, you know, mocking up what would be a brain and using that electrolysis to be able to to get it out of his of his brain. It's just it's I'm interested to see how it's going to evolve down the in the in the near future or not, you know, hopefully in the next couple of years, how some of this science can actually be expanded upon and really developed. Yeah, well, Hubbard talks about that himself in the uh, in the introduction to Battlefield Earth about how science fiction is the presager of, of all technical right. developments. And first you get the idea, the dream, and then somebody figures out how to do it. And he certainly came up with some marvelous bits of technology that just lack maybe a little bit of something that somebody's going to pick up on. And like, oh, <laughs> boom, there it is. I've seen and that actually happened a lot of several times with some of the other LRH fiction I've read where it was speculative fiction back in 1950 or, or earlier. And then you're like, Oh, well, I have one here, you know? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Like you said, you know, like he talked about drones, which, you know, yeah. all of a now that's just a standard fare right now. The whole that's thing right. about drones. Every six year old has a drone. <laughs> I think so. So, um, one of the area that, that, uh, people may or may not know you as is a uh, voiceover artists and talent and you've got some amazing projects that they can find you on on YouTube but what what's anything that you got coming or how how do people see you currently uh yeah well I you know I put an awful lot of stuff up on YouTube I really like YouTube a lot I, I meet people from all over the world and uh, I can post up any sort of crazy idea I have uh, I, I uh, I've been doing a lot with the deep fake technology uh, so uh, collaborating with a guy named uh, Shamuk in England, and we've created quite a few things that are uh, pretty popular, uh, where I do impressions and then 
change my face basically into the person I'm imitating. It's a very weird illusion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but again, going to be very commonplace very soon as it spreads. Um, yeah, and I, I do the verse, voice of Colonel Sanders quite often for the radio and the TV show, too. And, uh, commercials, that is, uh, the KFC brand. So uh, people would know me, or they wouldn't know it's me, but I, hopefully they wouldn't know it's me. But now I just spilled the beans. And uh, yeah, I'm always... You still do, stuff, always you still do the things. crossing crossing the uh, the Delaware? Oh, I did uh, George Washington crossing the Delaware for Geico a few years ago, yeah. Yeah. I, I haven't been I haven't been across the uh, Delaware Expressway in a while, but okay, but I'm ready to go back anytime. Oh, good. I've been so, on this side of the Expressway for quite a while, so ready yes, to go. Yes, yes. So, where do they find all these different videos? What's What's the channel? Well, you can go to uh, YouTube and just type in my name, Jim Meskimen, or Jim Pressions is my other handle, and I'm on Instagram on Jim Pressions, and uh, also JimMeskimen.com. You can find a lot of stuff there. And they can definitely find a lot of stuff from you if they go to galaxypress.com and get Battlefield Earth mm -hmm. or any of the stories from the Golden Age or Final Blackout or, right. or, or. Whatever, whatever's been released. That's, a, that's how you can find me. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jim. It's been a pleasure talking with you. And um, uh, I'm hoping that people are going to get this and just realize that this is going to be a really good summer read, summer listen, and uh, heed your words of wisdom. Yes. And, you know, I mean, if you have a young person in your life and you're concerned about how much time they're spending watching video games, give them Battlefield Earth, the, uh, the little thumb drive that John showed, and I'm sure he'll show again, and let them just listen to that. It's much, I think it's much more engaging, much better, and it uh, makes use of their uh, creative imagination, creative potential, even better than a game. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jim. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, John. Woof, woof. <laughs> okay, great.